This afternoon, uh, President Emmert will make a few comments and then we'll open it up to questions. Uh, if you have a question, please identify yourself and your affiliate. With that, President Emmert. Well, thank you very much. Good to see you all again. Uh, if my voice is a little hoarse, that's because we've been talking a, a long time for, um, for the past day and a half about all the issues that are so pressing in intercollegiate athletics. I brought with me also four of our, of our presidents, so when we get into Q&A, you can, thank you, we can, um, we can also talk to um, some of them and they can express their views. These have been, uh, these three sessions over a day and a half have been uh, easily the most consequential and in-depth discussions that I've ever been a part of in my 30 years in higher education around intercollegiate athletics. The uh, presidents all came together with a very clear, strong consensus that status quo and continued order of the day was insufficient and that we needed to have change in a number of key areas and we needed to have it quickly. There's a very strong sense among all of the presidents that I share that in the areas that uh, we discussed yesterday and again uh, uh, today that we talked about in terms of the integrity of intercollegiate athletics and the expectations we have of our students in, in the classroom, that uh, we need to step up and make a number of significant changes. Uh, yesterday, as some of you uh, heard already, we discussed the ways in which we deploy our resources, that we need to steward our resources as carefully as possible and deploy them to the best effect uh, that we can, recognizing the economic realities of the day. These are very challenging times for, uh, for all of us in all walks of life and higher education and intercollegiate athletics is no different. At the same time, we want to make sure that we're using resources to support our student athletes and their success as effectively as we possibly can, and therefore we will be bringing back to the, uh, to the uh, Division I Board of Directors a proposal to, uh, to look at a set of issues around student welfare, including whether or not we want to extend the size of the student grant and aid, whether or not we want to, uh, to create multi-year scholarship options for individual conferences, and whether we want to find other ways to support our students academically. Today we began the day talking about uh, issues of integrity and the challenges that we face in terms of the enforcement of all of our rules. We reached, again, very strong uh, assertive uh, consensus around a handful of things. First of all, we all agree that the NCAA rulebook uh, needs some serious editing. Uh, the rules are, in some cases, uh, too complex, unenforceable, in some ways convoluted, in some ways even irrelevant. And so we agreed that we will, again, in very short order, meaning months, not years, bring back to the Division I uh, Board of Directors a, uh, a set of revisions to our rule book that will do two things. Clean up some of the ancillary issues that are in the rule book and focus our attention on those things that are serious threats to the integrity of intercollegiate athletic, athletics, those things that actually make a difference in, uh, in our institutions and not uh, necessarily those things that deal with uh, communication devices or uh, whether or not a bagel has peanut butter on it or not. Uh, we also agreed that we have to make sure that we have a set of penalties associated with those serious uh, rules violations that provide strong disincentives to people who are involved in intercollegiate athletics. That those penalties, in fact, uh, create not only disincentives, but in fact uh, a healthy fear of, um, of being caught or the implications of being caught in violation of our, of our rules. We had a good discussion about uh, the ways in which we run our, our uh, enforcement practices and the kinds of structure that we have around all of our, um, all of our uh, rules and, and the kinds of violations that we can create, uh, the kind of violations that we define, and that, and that those violations today are too crude in their definition between just secondary and, um, and majors, and that we need a multi-tiered model for defining uh, inappropriate behavior, and we'll be bringing those proposals back to the board in the coming months as well. And finally, we agreed that we need to be as assertive as we can on the enforcement <coughs> side, working in partnership with our institutions, but being, uh, being assertive and making sure that we have the resources in our investigative arm in our enforcement offices uh, that will allow us to do the kind of work that we need to do to make sure we understand what's going on uh, out in the world. In the afternoon, then, we, we excuse me, changed our focus 
to focus on academics with a clear, strong consensus that we want to make sure that our student athletes are just that, that they're students as well as athletes, that they are serious students, that they're committed to being successful in the classroom and that we're going to hold institutions and the members of our institutions even more accountable than we have in the past. The set of reforms that were put in place about eight or ten years ago have had a very significant positive impact. We're very proud of that. We're very, we're very pleased with the kind of progress that we've made, but we have significant ways to go, especially in the areas of football and men's basketball and some other sports as well, but predominantly in those two areas. So what the board agreed, excuse me, what the presidents agreed to, to um, have the board do as soon as tomorrow morning to begin to look at changes that we can bring to our academic expectations of our student athletes. Uh, first and foremost, we want to look at increasing the APR, the academic progress rate. Uh, that rate has been, uh, has been fixed now for, for around eight years. Uh, we all believe it's time to increase it. We will likely increase it at least to a, to a 930 for the base setting of the APR, and we may want to look at even moving it further in the coming years. But we want to make that decision, and we want to make it quickly. Secondly, we agreed that we would bring back to the Board of Directors a set of proposals around increasing initial eligibility expectations for students who move into our institutions. That we would increase the expectations around the GPA standards, we'd increase the expectations around the core curriculum that students must take, and we'll look at the sliding scale with GPA and test scores so that we know that we're bringing in young men and young women in, into our institutions that are ready and capable to do college level work. Similarly, we decided that we had to uh, address issues around the academics of uh, community college or junior college transfers into our universities where we've had some very significant academic challenges and we will also be bringing forward in those areas a set of proposals in the coming uh, months to increase the academic expectations of students who are moving from, from two-year institutions to four-year institutions so we, can, so we can have the kinds of outcomes that we want there. And then finally, uh, we came to a strong agreement that we need to, this year, in fact, as, as soon as October or January at the latest, we want to make a decision to set clear academic expectations for participation in any of our tournaments. That institutions who participate in our tournaments need to be meeting the APR expectations that we have of all of our institutions to be to be uh, set rigidly and that if you don't meet those expectations, you will not be allowed to participate in our tournaments, including the men's basketball tournament. And we'll be bringing forward specific proposals around that in the very near future. Uh, those issues, as well as a handful of other ancillary issues, were vetted at great length. Uh, they involved, uh, I think, very, very thoughtful conversations and we had uh, great support around all of them. We also had clear commitment to move forward with significant dispatch to move those kinds of issues on a fast track so that we can make decisions in short order. And I think you're going to see some uh, pretty remarkable things in the coming uh, months. And with that, I'd be happy to open uh, the floor to questions and invite my president colleagues to come forward. So questions? Yes. And again, could you identify who you are and and who you represent. Yeah. Mr. Emmerich, Bob Holtzman from ESPN. Yeah, um, what you just talked about, the uh, academic requirements to be eligible to play in the tournaments. Yes. How realistic is that? How quickly could that happen? It's very realistic and it'll happen very quickly, meaning uh, this year. The, uh, the, the, I think the most important component that has to be considered is how quickly you implement it. So there's been conversations, for example, about having a, having a sliding scale over the next two or three years so that we give coaches and programs a chance to adjust academically because of course you know academic cycles take a while but one could imagine two or three or four years out where we say you have to have a 930 APR and next year it's a 900 then a 910 then a 920 then a 930 but we will we will set that standard uh, I think very very quickly and I know the the presidents agree that that's critical anybody care to comment on it no Yes. Hi, Aaron Hartness with WRAL TV in Raleigh. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on some of the academic uh, po components you discussed, particularly the admissions component of it? Well, what we know is, of course, if we if we uh, increase admissions, the the uh, eligibility standards and and uh, encourage 
young men and young women to take, first of all, a core curriculum in a nice, thoughtful sequence through high school. If we have higher expectations for grade point averages, we know that those students come to our institutions better prepared and their probability of success is much higher. Uh, when you add into that the huge demands that are placed on Division I athletes in terms of the time commitments and energy that it requires, uh, we want to make sure that students come to us ready to be college students and ready to be successful. Uh, I, I might ask uh, any of the presidents here to make a comment. This is Graham Spanier from Penn State. Graham, you want to you comment on academic preparedness? Well, let me say that in my 20 years as a university president, this is the most substantive conversation that has taken place uh, on athletic matters at the collegiate level. And what stands out uh, above everything else is the unanimity of thinking among the university presidents who were assembled for this discussion. There is a, an unwavering determination to change a number of things about intercollegiate athletics today. Presidents are fed up with the rule breaking that's out there. We are determined to elevate the academic standards. Uh, we are concerned about the rapidly escalating costs of running intercollegiate athletics programs, and all of these issues come together in very important ways for us. I also must say that there is a tremendous support for Mark Emmert's leadership, and I believe that we will see a tremendous amount of change put into effect this year. Some of it will be phased in over a period of time, but you can expect uh, that, that there will be quite a bit of action taken on these academic issues, on these integrity issues, on these financial issues, and always with the welfare of our student athletes in mind. Next. I'm Brian Benham with ESPN.com. I uh, just want to ask about uh, the changes to the rules in the rule book. Uh, how, how significant is that in terms of, do you feel like it's something you need to kind of start over and rewrite the whole thing? And then how do you write the rules to where people don't try to find the loopholes? Sure. Well, um, we'd love to probably throw the rule book out and start all over again, but that's actually impractical. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to take advantage of, first of all, a lot of really good thought that's already been put into this by a number of groups we've had working on uh, these, the, the rule issues for, for quite some time now. We'll bring back to the, uh, to, the, to the board of directors, as I mentioned, as quickly as we can, at least parts of that probably in October, others in January. But no later than eight, the April board meeting, we'd like to have in front of them a full proposal that, that includes the kinds of edits that we want inside that rule book. That's going to take a monumental bit of work. Uh, we're going to have to talk to lots and lots of different groups around intercollegiate athletics and be very inclusive in the front end. But then we need to make decisions and we need to be able to step up and say, we're going to do this or we aren't going to do it. A bit, a bit like a base closure commission model where we just say, here's the changes, vote for them or not. We, we're not going to allow this to be killed by death by a thousand cuts. Will, will, people, um, will people look for loopholes? People will always look for loopholes if they're inclined to do so. Uh, people do it every day in, in life. Uh, you can't legislate integrity, but you can define it and you can insist on it, and that's what we intend to do. I'd love to have Judy Genshap, the president of South Florida, who's chair of the Division I board, uh, comment a little bit about how we're going to, going to move forward on these things in, with some dispatch. So, Judy? Thank you. Uh, the board of Division I will be um, ready at all of our meetings, including tomorrow. We're going to start with some action items that will uh, help us move the um, agenda forward in a, in a very rapid pace. We know that um, with our new leadership and with a lot of innovation that this is a time that NCAA, I believe, will be in the best place it's ever been. So um, we're prepared to move forward as uh, rapidly as we receive the uh, recommendations and they will start tomorrow. Yes. Mike Merritt from yeah, Associated Mike. Press. Mark, can you talk a little bit about the APR, I believe, comes out in May. So are you going to be basing this on the previous year? And 
you know, when are, when are school, when would schools be notified as to what the standards are and what the standards are going to be for the following yeah. year and that sort of thing? Sure, good question. Well, uh, that will be one of the issues that's actually discussed tomorrow. Um, we need to, of course, give schools some, some lead time because you can't turn academic matters on a dime. But uh, the, the, um, the board wants to and, and, and the presidents all want to announce as quickly as possible, here's what the new target will be and then we'll make a decision uh, tomorrow or, in, or at the next board meeting as to uh, how quickly we want to impose that. If we move to, for example, if the board decides to move to a 930, there would be a, a year or two lag time. But you know, the, the APR is all measured on a rolling four-year average, as you know, and so we gotta, we've got to let people uh, roll that into, um, into their calculation. So it'll be, as, as we've noted, a, a year or so rolling all of these things in, but we have to make the decisions now let everyone know what's coming so they can anticipate and adjust. Uh, you may have part this is Pat Forty from ESPN.com, or Mark, you may have partially this, but Judy, well, what specifically might be on the docket for tomorrow? Well, uh, tomorrow, one of the items that we might uh, hear about is the academic uh, uh, 9.30, whether we want to uh, vote that in as a, as a minimum level. Um, so that is one that I know we'll have a full discussion on, and um, uh, we'll see what else is brought up tomorrow as well. Yes, Aaron. Um, we had a, a case recently in our area in which a UNC football player, former football player, sued. Um, part of the argument was that his rights as a player were violated. Was there any discussion today about players' rights or the appeals process or anything like that? Well, obviously, I, I can't comment on individual situations or cases, but uh, first and foremost on the agenda throughout the day and a half was student welfare. And, and what do we do that supports students and their success as students and their success as athletes? So. Uh, student welfare is top of mind for all of these presidents. That's why they're in this, this enterprise. Um, did we talk about specific issues like the one you're describing? No, but, but everything was discussed in the context of what does this mean for student athletes? Yes. Well, what we don't want is, is what we all fear is the case right now, and that is that we have um, uh, individuals, whether they're coaches or student athletes or boosters or agents, anybody involved, sitting there doing a cost-benefit analysis. You know, what's the, what's the reward for cheating versus what's the risk? And if, the, and if it's the perception that the risk is low, both of being uh, caught and the, the punishment that may come from being caught, then people uh, can engage in bad behavior and they, and they feel like it's a, a good business decision despite their own ethical composition. Uh, we want to make sure that people understand that, that we intend to focus our attention on places that make the biggest impact on the, the integrity of intercollegiate athletics and that the penalties will be concomitant to, to uh, those, um, those um, uh, bad behaviors, <laughs> violations. Yes. Well, I, you know, I may ask some of the other presidents to respond to that, but, but in general, I think they're the things that we would all look at. You know, in, in, in areas where you've got individuals who are uh, engaged in, in paying student athletes to, to move to your institution or to participate, providing a variety of, um, of inappropriate benefits. Uh, being less than forthright in your interactions with the NCAA and enforcement opportunities, uh, a whole range of issues around agents and third party misbehaviors, uh, academic fraud, uh, all of those things I think we would all agree are pretty fundamental threats. I, I might ask Ed Ray to, to comment a bit about that too. Ed is the president of Oregon State University uh, and he is the chair of the executive committee of the NCAA. Yeah, I, I would just go back to what uh, Graham said, that uh, the presidents really feel that uh, the issue of integrity in the game is, is so important that we need to make certain that the rules that we operate with don't inadvertently get in our way. So we need to look at the rule book and see if there are some things we need to eliminate because, in fact, 
uh, their petty grievances and they're never going to be adjudicated well? Are there some things that ought to be handled at the conference level to make certain that we're looking at the big picture and the important uh, matters that come before us and that they get adjudicated as uh, quickly and effectively as uh, possible? And I think there's a, a clear understanding. I think that hopefully that's the undercurrent of the last two days that uh, Mark Emmert called for this retreat. He talked to people. He understood that business as usual uh, wasn't where we wanted to be, that we want to make uh, substantive changes, mostly focused on student success and student uh, welfare. And this was an important area where we think we need to uh, take a very uh, new and uh, creative look at the way we're uh, managing rules and regulations so that uh, we keep our eye on the prize and don't get distracted by small matters that uh, really keep us from the broader issues that need to be addressed. Things like uh, paying players, cheating, academic fraud, uh, really all the issues that uh, Mark raised and others. This is for Mark or Judy. Could, could you talk about the process of trying to push this through. It's great right now to say this is going to be, you know, we're going to have a proposal to you by October or January or whatever, but the process has always been sort of a year-long cycle. Are you going to try and speed this process up in some way to put it through in emergency legislation or some other fashion? Well, I'll let, I'll let Judy talk a bit about that, uh, obviously, as well, but the, the presidents have been unequivocal about their interest in doing this with as much uh, speed as we can, consistent with making thoughtful decisions. And the, the, the Division I Board of Directors has full authority to take such actions. This is not you know, something that we're doing outside the, uh, the normal channels. They have the capacity to, to pass judgment on these things. They are all issues that, that uh, various commissions and committees have been working on for months and in some cases years. So we've already got great work. Uh, that's been done, we'll gather up all of that work and then we're going to move forward and take action. So uh, I, I, don't, I wouldn't describe this as, as emergency, even though that might be the technical term for the, for the way we can make decisions done, but it is clearly a strong sense of urgency. Judy? Well, I would agree. Uh, this is, the topics that we discussed were broader topics. We weren't getting down to uh, very minute levels of uh, detail. So we're looking at the broader impact, uh, not only impact, but the broader topics. As uh, President Emmert had said, we're gathering the information that already exists from many of the committees that are working on these uh, kinds of issues. Again, financial sustainability, integrity issues, as well as the academic success is issues. So we already have a lot of input. What we want is to take some action on it in a more rapid fashion, and we do have the prerogative of, of doing so. And we, we plan to have this year as a very, very uh, impactful year for NCAA and for all of the student athletes in the institutions. Mr. Emmert, it was reported today that Ohio State's been notified that the investigation into its football program continues as we speak. I know they're gonna be here in front of the committee on Friday. I just want to know what your thoughts are on this entire situation. Well, I'm not going to comment on any ongoing uh, cases for fairly obvious reasons. Uh, we have a process in place and we'll let that process work out. But nice try. <laughs> I think it's actually really important to point out that uh, you know, the NCAA, this, these are very important matters, and the NCAA has a, a group that specifically looks at infractions, looks at issues of enforcement, and, and in a sense, there's a real firewall between the work that that group does and the rest of the activity around uh, the NCAA. So we, we find really extraordinarily dedicated, effective people to serve in those roles. They're very hard jobs and we stay out of their way, we don't meddle, and we don't talk about where they are in their deliberations. So those are, those are very much independent, objective, arm's length reviews that go on, and, and we'll know what the outcomes are about the same time that you, you do. 
Yeah, just wanted to ask you, you talked about stronger penalties and disincentives for cheating. Uh, what would some of those look like? Are we talking about postseason bans, uh, stronger penalties for coaches who get out of the line? Or? Well, I think, I think uh, you know, all of the above. The, the list of, of penalties that's within uh, the, the reach of the NCAA is pretty well established. It's just a matter of making sure that we, we have them in sufficient quantity and quality that they have an impact of changing behavior. Jeff Rabb, down to the rivals, and just Jeff. for Graham and Judy, if I could. For years, people have heard about councils and committees and proposals, yet seen little substantive change. This seems like this is different. Can you talk about why is this time different? Well, you know, um, just as your media industry has changed over the last eight to nine years, things happen instantaneously and it gets out right away. Um, I think the rapidity uh, and moving things faster is very important for NCAA as well in terms of the, the it's not that it shouldn't be studied, but there are some, some uh, items that need to be moved much faster than they are right now. Um, like I said, we have a lot of committees that are working. They have the data. We have to bring it together in a, in a uh, more efficient and effective manner. I'd say what's different now is that a lot of things have reached a boiling point. Uh, under the NCAA's current governance structure, the Board of Director has the authority to make some changes that historically it's been reluctant to make because we're a membership organization and we're always hoping that all of these different committees and councils will collectively send up the legislation that will make things work well. But I think the presidents have reached a point where they've said there's too many things that are not working well. And so the board needs to be prepared to take stronger actions directly from the top, more so from the bottom. And what we heard was this unanimity of thinking from a very large number of presidents representing themselves and and their conferences here at this meeting saying, you know, we've reached a point where we must pay more attention to these academic issues, to these integrity issues. Uh, some of these things our coaches and our boosters might not like, but uh, we need to do what I think you're going to see happen in the next year. And on the integrity issue, I would say coaches and athletes and boosters should be afraid now if they're going to go out and break any rules because people have had enough of that. We're going to de-emphasize the nuisance rules that nobody cares about and that don't matter and focus significantly greater resources on the enforcement of major fractions. So the cheaters, the rule breakers, the folks that are trying to disrupt the integrity of intercollegiate athletics in this country are going to have to be held more accountable than has been the case in, in the past. So I'm Tim White. I'm the chancellor of the University of California, Riverside. And I'd like to comment on your question. Quite frankly, it's time for tough love in intercollegiate athletics. It's as simple as that. It has to be timely, but it has to be tough. And what I appreciated a lot about the frankness of our discussions today, today and yesterday was that the very center of it all is the best interest of the student athlete while they're a student athlete at the universities and colleges of America, but also as they go through forward in life. This is about creating an environment where they can succeed academically, earn their degree in a timely way, a meaningful degree, uh, if, they can, if they go out and compete in professional sports, they're still going to have to come back at some point and try and use their academic training as well. And so the fact that it was student-centered, and it's going to be some hard pills to swallow, but the intent here is to improve the welfare for our students. I mean, that's a very noble place for us to be and a place where we should be as a collegiate model of intercollegiate athletics. I uh, started my career uh, as a coach and as an athlete back in the 70s and then moved into academics. and have had leadership positions now at three D Division I universities, so I care in my second term on the Board of Directors. So I care deeply and have a long but practical and intellectual interest in this, 
But I do think the notion for me it's time for tough love and otherwise the, the overall enterprise will not be able to be sustained and will not, the American public deserves this. Uh, we're actually responding to, to our own observations and the public's uh, view of us as, as leaders. Ken Dirtall with Fox 59. I wanted to ask a little bit. I know that yesterday more time was probably spent talking about the student aid. I wasn't here for that, but I did want to find out from, from you moving forward, is there kind of a consensus pushing ahead to these times when we'll be having votes on things like this um, with specifics in mind when it comes to the student aid? And are conferences going to be having more leeway when it comes to that? Well, that's certainly the, uh, the conversation that we had in a, in a clear sense of the presidents that they would like to look at a specific proposal that would provide conferences with the opportunity to, to uh, provide grant and aid that, that went up to but never to exceed the full cost of attendance of, an of, uh, of that specific institution. There was also, as I mentioned, uh, a significant interest in conferences having the opportunity if they choose to, to have multi-year scholarships be, be available inside, those institu inside the institutions of that conference. Uh, those things need to be decided not at the institutional level but at a conference by conference level. Uh, some conferences may well decide that they don't want to go toward a full cost of attendance grant and aid model and that's perfectly fine. Other conferences may decide that that makes sense for them. Uh, everyone wants to see what the details of that proposal will be so that we don't have um, completely disproportionate competitive equity issues but, um, but I think there's clearly an interest in moving toward that and we're very likely to see it in the, in the very near future. I'd like to just add to that. One of the aspects of the whole meeting uh, for both days was about shared responsibility, that it's not just NCAA as a membership organization that we're looking at to carry out a lot of the, um, the issues, but it, it's also the conferences as well as the institutions as well as the individuals within the institutions. So it is, uh, the, the topics are very broad and uh, they're very important and it is important for all of us to take that responsibility. Um, and uh, I, I think the kind of leadership that was shown uh, over this past uh, few days will really, uh, not only shape the agenda, but also uh, put some of that responsibility or, and share it with, with others as well. Mark, actually, we received uh, one question via Twitter. Okay. <laughs> and it said, uh, Answer it, President yeah. Emory, could you, could you address uniform or consistent penalties for infraction cases? Well, if it's a student athlete, I prospective student athlete, I can't, I can't text back. So, um, well, we, we, had a, we actually had a, a pretty robust conversation about precisely that issue. And, and the, the way in which I think everyone agrees we, we need to attack it is by moving toward, a, as I mentioned, a, a model that defines infractions in multiple categories rather than just two broad categories. And then we want to bring back to the board a proposal that says we'll have something along the lines of sentencing guidelines so that institutions and individuals know that in this kind of infraction, here's the range of, of um, uh, penalties that can be, that can be put, put in play. Uh, and that can provide some greater consistency in, in the perceptions of what's going on. At the same time, though, we all agree that the Committee on Infractions has been incredibly successful at looking at the fullness of cases. Every case has its own unique set of circumstances. Every case we have to interpret and they have to interpret in a very specific way, just like occurs in a court of law. And while there needs to be a range of penalties associated with any type of infraction, the difference between extra benefits when it's $150 and a car is quite different. But yet the nature of that penalty might both be described as uh, additional un uh, inappropriate benefits. The Committee on Infractions has to have the capacity to provide latitude in, in making those decisions. Discretion is still going to be very, very important. Yes, Karen. I 
That's a great question. We've, we've had over the past really nine months now really good conversations that the NFL and the NFL Players Association have been a part of to talk about how do we deal with the, the agents and third party uh, problems. And those conversations for the first time brought together NFL, NFL Players Association, attorneys general from around the country because uh, the vast majority of states have, have uh, statutes now prohibiting those kind of behaviors. Our people, head football coaches, agents themselves because the majority of agents are good people doing good services. Uh, and, and while we haven't reached specific proposals to date, we've had good conversations about what that might look like. And I, I anticipate that in short order we'll have some, some good thoughts about that. And the NFL has been a thoughtful participant in that, and we'll see where it leads. Okay, we have time for one more question. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.